right, well, we hit the time, so I'm getting this live. Um, I guess my first announcement is uh, we are working on some possible changes for our volunteer structure to get some a full scope of activities going again. So we're making some plans. Um, I have been praying a lot about it and had a good conversation with Pastor Tom this morning. I appreciate that, brother. So we're working on making some changes. So you, we might change things up in a couple weeks and see how it goes. So stay tuned for interesting changes and in where we meet and who's doing what. Um, stay tuned. Enough. Stay what tuned. Same bad time, same bad channel. Uh, we have a couple announcements. Uh, the big one is that uh, Food Pantry is coming up this Saturday. So Saturday the 28th from 8.30 to 11.30, we've got food. Uh, Darlene is on, Eric is on. Hi guys, welcome, welcome. Um, and we had we, double blessings. Um, we earlier this week received a large delivery of hams through Sunday Breakfast Mission, and now they've got more coming. And uh, God is good, amen. And uh, what did Mark say? Was it six pantries that got hams, I think? Yeah. So through the abundant blessing that came to the mission, they were able to bless six other pantries. And so I would say thousands of people are going to get some food out of this, right? You figure each of those hams is going to a family with more than one person. We're breaking into the thousands of people who are getting food through just that one donation, that one company. So um, amen. And I just wanted to share that. God is just so good. And we, uh, as quick as we are to ask for help, we need to be even quicker to say thank you. Amen. So, amen. Amen. Um, let's see. Jane is on with us as well. So we have Jane, Darlene, and Eric, and Bethany. Hello, Bethany. Um, so uh, you guys online, if you have any prayer requests, please go ahead and post them in the chat. And we'll see, does anyone in the room have a prayer request you'd like to share? Okay, Darlene Kay said she saw Beth. Our Beth, like Bible study Beth? No, Beth, Beth Cooksey. Beth Cooksey. Not the one who used to come to Bible study? Okay, well, we'll Darlene says that's awesome. Darlene, are we talking about the same Beth? I'm confused. No, <laughs> Darlene probably knows more than one. Well, that's good news. That's good news. Um, we got a good report from Jill's mom yesterday. She is, um, she's not fully recovered from COVID, but she is recovering. So the doctors think she's over the worst of it and she's doing better than she was. So far, uh, Jill's dad has not gotten sick. So uh, thank you for all your prayers there. They seem to have gotten through with a lighter case. So uh, we're very, very thankful for that. Um, Jane also said thank you um, for, it's a praise that she's feeling much better. She said thank you everyone for your prayers. And Darlene said yes, it's the same Beth I'm talking about. Yeah. How is it? It is yeah. the same Beth I know. Okay, from Bible study. Yep. All right, I haven't seen her in a while. How's she doing? Yeah. She misses us. Maybe she'll be back on well, I miss her. She yeah. has such a sweet heart. Yes, she is. Yeah, she's a lovely person. Uh, so Jane, her praise is that she's feeling better. She was in church this morning, so she's uh, getting over her bronchitis, so amen for that. Um, Bethany uh, has two weeks left in uh, her phlebotomy school, which I can't spell phlebotomy, so I say stabby school. But... Um, so two weeks left, she's doing really well. So I, I'm not sure if everybody knew that, that she was working to make a job change. So she went back to school for phlebotomy for drawing blood. She needs volunteers. She does. In the next couple of weeks, she's going to start asking for some volunteers to practice on. So I know a couple of us already volunteered our arms for her to poke us. Um, yeah, she lined herself up for yeah. Tuesday night. Yep. I think uh, Tuesday night women's group, everybody's getting band-aids. <laughs> But <laughs> uh, I told her she should stop by men's group too. So. Um, Darlene has a prayer request for one of her patients named Amy. Uh, 
Thank you, Darlene. Do we have any other praises, concerns? I'd like to continue praying for friend Rick Camp. <clears throat> that God will heal his heart to hopefully where he won't need a heart transplant. <clears throat> this is your neighbor with the goat, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Make sure I keep all the names straight. <laughs> when you have a neighbor with a goat, that makes him easily identifiable. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll keep praying for Ray. He's our shepherd in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wonderful. And uh, um, Jill's friend that's in ICU. Yes, we don't have a firm update yet. Um, we got some mixed information, so we're not exactly I do know that her surgery went well. Yeah, we have a little bit of a scare because somebody from the hospital started telling some people that she'd passed away. So we got a little bit scared, but... We were able to confirm that that's not the case. That's not true. Um, she had surgery like midweek this week, and it it went well. Um, I don't think she's been released from the hospital yet. Yeah, she probably has a long road. Yeah, she has quite a long road. She'll definitely have to go to like rehab and stuff like that after this. Okay. I mentioned that your mom's doing better. Um, Darlene has asked for prayers, please. Um, she said the, the good news is that the steroids they gave her for her back cleared out her sinuses and lungs. <laughs> so we'll, we'll give her back. We'll, we'll thank God for, the, for that and please keep praying for her back. Um, she is in severe pain. You guys know Darlene's a tough lady and especially for her to have to miss church. We know she's hurting. Um, I'm just going to scroll through. Oh, my mom is on. Hi, mom. We planted some flowers that my mom gave Jill for her birthday. Yes, and by we, I mean Jill and Annika. Yes, I cut the grass. They, they plant the flowers. All right, I think that's all that I see on Facebook. Any other prayer requests? Yes, Worky. I have finals next week. Ooh. <laughs> Worky you. Beacha. Finals next week. Um, we have kind of a personal one that I wanted to share. The Petersons have been asking us for prayer for their friend Barry. Um, he had a, a sudden onset of respiratory failure. Went to the hospital, he was diagnosed with ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, last week he'd been transferred out of Cooper into McGee, a, a long-term facility, but um, they met with the specialist this week and did not get uh, hopeful news. Um, they're not sure that there is really much else they can do for him medically. So there's um, the possibility that he will be going on to hospice care next week. So um, we want to especially pray for his wife and three kids. Um, it's, it, was, it was difficult news to take. Um, Mona said that Barry seems to be taking it the best of anyone, um, that he is sure of his faith, and he, he is secure in, in where he's going. So he's, he's okay with what has happened, but it's, it's been very hard on his wife and children. So please pray for Barry and his family. Um, Darlene also asked for prayer for her grandchildren. Um, anyone else have a prayer request? We have kind of some big ones going on in the world that I want to keep praying for. Uh, of course, the war in Ukraine, the victims of the last two shootings last week in California and in uh, Buffalo, New York, uh, the, the baby formula shortage, which the news is reporting is supposed to be letting up soon. Um, but please pray. Um, we know that that factory didn't just make baby formula, so there are some other shortages of some hospital needs, you know, 
Jill's dealing with some of that at work right now, with some shortages of some supplies. Um, as COVID hospitalizations are going up, um, thankfully it looks like the death rates are very, very low, but medical supplies are getting taxed again. You know, their hospital's low on saline right now, um, which is, that's the thing everybody gets. <laughs> so please pray for, for those kinds of issues. Um, I also had another prayer. Um, I'm not at liberty to share the name, but um, a friend of mine that I have volunteered with at the hospital for quite a long time now, about 12 years, her husband is in the hospital. He, is, he has previously had a kidney transplant. She actually donated her kidney to him. And now he's uh, in heart failure. And so he was evaluated at Jefferson to be put on the transplant list, and they said that his lung function was too poor for him to qualify. So they're having him evaluated um, at um, University of Penn and somewhere else. Um, two other hospitals are gonna evaluate him at. Um, so please pray for, for that situation. Um, sorry, Temple and, and Penn. They're going to try. So he is very frustrated. They, they both are very frustrated, but it, this has been a very stressful season. He's been in and out of the hospital a lot the past couple of months. Um, he's been on and off dialysis and just dealing with lots of trouble. In the middle of that, he had COVID, which certainly didn't help things. So please pray for their family. Yeah. Yes, Carol. I told Sandy that we pray for her. She's uh... She's recovering from COVID, but she has what they call COVID hair. She's lost just about all her hair. <clears throat> and her, she says, is shorter than her husband's. I just talked to another lady who had that happen. Yeah. Her hair used to be almost as long as mine. Yeah, the lady I just talked to, she's getting fitted for a wig because of it. Her hair's just not coming back. I'm not going to tell Sandy that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Oops, she's not but, yeah. <coughs> Darlene, I'm not sure what that last uh, comment was. If you could explain. Um, but yeah, so let's join together in prayer. Father God, Thank you for this day and this chance to gather. Father, thank you for caring for us and providing for us. Father, thank you for the gift of your Son and the gift of your Spirit. Thank you for the hope and the peace that you give us. Thank you for the joy that is in our lives because of you. Thank you so much for providing for the mission and for our pantry and the other pantries. Father, we are so blessed. And we are so grateful that you ensure that needs are met. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Father God, we lift up some other needs to you today. Uh, we pray that you would be with Darlene in her pain, Father. We pray that she would have relief from the pain in her back, that you would help her to be able to sleep and to work. Uh, we, we pray the same for Venus, Father, as she's getting some x-rays done and seeing a surgeon this week. We pray that you would be with her with her back pain as well. We lift up Darlene's patient, Amy. Um, we pray that you would be with her. Father, we lift up um, the Isaac's neighbor, Rick. Father, we thank you for his testimony and his faith. We thank you for being with him on this journey. And Father, if it's your will, we pray that his heart would be healed, whether it's a, a transplant or a miracle or a surgery or whatever, Father. Um, but just thank you for his testimony and the state of his spirit as he's going through this trial. Father, we lift up this woman, Lori, in the hospital um, after this terrible assault. Father, we pray for her family. Uh, we know she has some children, and I can't imagine what they're dealing with now, with their father gone and their mother in intensive care. Uh, so, Father, we pray for their whole family, for them emotionally, spiritually. Father, we pray for Lori physically. We thank you that her surgery went well. And we pray that, um, that she would heal from her injuries. 
Father, we praise you for uh, Jill's mom and for Jane and their recoveries from their illnesses. Thank you for their healing. Father, we lift up uh, Darlene's grandkids and, and a lot of our other young people, Worky with finals next week and Annika with finals the week after. Uh, Father, we pray that this time of testing would go well, that our children would do their best and that they would not feel too stressed about this process. We pray for the upcoming summer, Father, especially families who struggle with childcare and with meeting food needs. And I pray that you would help us to, to care for our neighbors in whatever way we can. Father, we lift up uh, my friend and her husband. We pray that you would be with him on his journey, Father. We're praying for a heart transplant. We're praying for restoration of his lung function. And we're praying for continued um, function of his kidney. Father, please be with him and please be with their family. Father, we lift up Sandy as she is recovering from some long-term symptoms of COVID. Father, um, we know that what she's dealing with right now isn't life-threatening, but it is very troubling. And we pray that you would give her comfort as she goes through this season and deals with this situation. Um, Father, we lift up Barry and his family as they've gotten news that was not what they were hoping for. Um, Father, we thank you for the state of Barry's soul. We thank you for his testimony and his witness to his family in the midst of such a terrible situation. Father, we don't know if it is time for him to go home to you or not. But whatever happens, we know that his wife and children need your help. They need your care. And we pray that you would... Father, give them comfort right now. They, they desperately need it. Um, we thank you for other news that we've received from around the district. Uh, Father, we thank you for the good news from Front Step that they were able to purchase a house. And uh, I pray that this summer would be a summer of ministry to children. We, we pray for your provision and protection and blessings over the camps that are going to happen, over teen camp, over children's camp, over LSR's basketball camp and over our family camp. Father, we pray that these would be moments where we could encounter you, where we would walk away changed and formed and challenged. Father, help us to come with open hearts, especially for the young people, Father, who don't know you. We pray that they would come into a saving relationship with you, receive forgiveness of sins, Father, and receive the joy and peace and love that you offer. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Darlene made a comment about toilet seat covers, and she said that's another one of the items on the shortage. Okay. I, mis when I misunderstood the toilet seat covers because there was another post in between. Okay. That makes more sense, a shortage of toilet seat covers. It's like, I hope we're not getting your shopping list. But. <laughs> okay. Um... Before we jump back into John chapter 2, I wanted to share just a moment from today's reading in our prayer guide. Um, today's reading is one that you are probably familiar with. It's one that I often use as a benediction in church. Uh, it's Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This uh, devotional thought was written by Tim Crump, who is the district superintendent in southwest Indiana. But he made this statement about halfway through that I wanted to share with you. He said that one of the important things that this statement does for us is that it moves the focus from us to God. And uh, that kind of knocked me on the floor a little bit when I was reading it. Just thinking of how much of my prayer life is focused on me compared to how much of my prayer life is focused on God. And maybe you can testify to this as well. I know that my prayer life is very different now than it was when I first became a believer. Um, when I first became a believer, I think my prayer time was more like a, a to-do list for God. <laughs> all the things I wanted God to do for me and my family and friends. And 
it has definitely changed, but it's a reminder that that's our goal, right? It's to focus on Him, not on ourselves. So I just wanted to share that quick thought and ask if anybody else might have a thought, maybe from today. Please. That scripture says, according to His power that works in us. Amen. It doesn't say it's for the for the stop one day. Yeah. Keep right on doing he's gonna keep right on doing what we need to have done. Thank God. Amen. Amen. I agree a lot a lot of my prayer life used to be focused on things that <clears throat> I wanted God to do. Mm -hmm. For me or for my family or for a loved one. Mm -hmm. And now most of my prayer life is thanksgiving, giving thanks. Amen. It has done a lot to change my heart. You know, I know I shared in my testimony this morning a little bit about my struggles with depression. But you probably noticed that pretty much every time I pray, the first thing I say is thank you. And that has been a word that the Holy Spirit put in my heart, and it has really helped me. Because I have honestly found that no matter how I'm feeling, no matter what I'm struggling with, I can always find something to be thankful for. Yeah. And it's not just a, a gimme. Like, it's not just a cheap throw something in there, right? God gives me really good things to be thankful for. <laughs> and, uh, Amen. yeah, the Holy Spirit has brought light into my heart through that process. I don't know if that's something you might want to try, or maybe you have, but. Actually, it actually makes me think about um, there are even like secular psychologists and stuff that, you know, part of their therapy is for people to think of things that they have gratitude for. Yeah, there's one therapist at the hospital that get, tells every patient to keep a thankfulness journal. Yeah. yeah. But like, think of how much more meaningful it is when you can actually thank. God for that thing and not just like, wow, the earth is pretty. It's just so much more. Yeah, when you're thanking the God who created you and loves you rather than just thank you for random chance. Yeah. It's a very different kind of thanks. It is. Because that first thanks is kind of, I mean, it's not empty, but it, it's kind of hopeless. That first kind of thanks doesn't bring hope. Because if you're just giving thanks for something that randomly happened, you have no hope. Yeah. No hope. So thank God. Thank God. All right, anything else anybody wanted to share before we jump into um, John chapter 2? Okay, so let's do a quick recap. Since you made the Batman reference earlier, right? Uh, if anybody uh, grew up watching Adam West like maybe I did, Right? <laughs> when they would do the multi-part episodes, they would start off where we last left our intrepid heroes, right? So let's jump into the gospel story and, and see where we last left off. Were you were watching reruns? They might have been, I don't know. They had to be. They were on yeah, bunny ears. I was nine the, years old. The so. stuff that he watched, I never watched as a kid. So Listen, I, when I was a little kid, I watched some good TV with my dad. We watched a lot of Three Stooges. We watched a lot of Adam West. Also some WWF, you know, a little professional wrestling mixed in there. Uh, some Laurel and Hardy for good measure. Good stuff, right? Good stuff. It's I know Laurel. No, he wasn't so much into the westerns, so I didn't really get into them. But I know Laurel. I'm an old soul. <laughs> but anyway, so I'm calling us kindred souls. So, if you want to take a sneak peek at the end of chapter one, see if you can figure out where Jesus was, who he was with, and what was going on. Did you want to share? It might have been on Nickelodeon. Thank you. <laughs> but not Jesus. We're back into the Bible. Yes. Yeah, Worky, did you have an answer? For what? <laughs> <laughs> I finally caught her without an answer. I said, if we look at the end of John chapter 1, 
Where was Jesus, and who was he with, and what was happening? Uh, he was with the first disciples. That's right. He had just called the first disciples. That's right. Now, um, he called Andrew and another unnamed follower of John the Baptist. Right? And once he Andrew got called, what did who did Andrew go see? Peter. Peter, his brother. That's right. Then he calls, they, they do a little bit of traveling. Do you know where they ended up? Um, they met Rhymes with Palilee, the city. Galilee. Galilee, right. And they met Philip. And after Philip received the good news, what did he do? He met, uh, Nathaniel. Yes, Nathaniel. And it's the, the spelling with the extra vowels that I never spell right. Um, so we are now, we, we've traveled from down by where John the Baptist was preaching. If Jerusalem was down here, Samaria is here, Galilee is up here. They traveled up into Galilee, and they are now um, kind of nearer to Jesus' hometown, near the Sea of Galilee, where a lot of these stories happen. Um, we know that Jesus was there. We know that his mother Mary was with him. And we know that these called disciples were with him. I'm not sure exactly who else was there. There might have been some other people there, but those are the ones that we know for sure. There, okay? So, John chapter 2, we're going to pick up there. It starts with the next day. So after, you know, Jesus saw Nathaniel under the fig tree, and we had this amazing experience. Um, they call him the Lamb of God. Yeah, everything's going great. Um, so let's jump in and see what happens next. Can somebody... Did you want to share? Well... Yeah, we, we sometimes, we, we take this for granted and skip over it, but it, it's for, the, for those of us uh, you know, we're, that are in this, we do take it for granted. The outside world, and including a bunch of uh, uh, smarty heads that don't want to question it, whatever question, they question the historicity of this. They, they question everything about it. I love the word the next day. There were people, when this was, uh, John most likely was written in the 60s. And there were people around that knew what was going on. They were there. They were around. Uh, they, they heard this. And they could verify whether it was the next day or not. And there are so many references like that. that I, I love the fact that John said, you know, I want you to, I'm providing some, some historical context here. And uh, I'm going to tell you, I'm not telling you it's just something I've made up here. This mm -hmm. is what happened. I love that. And I think that's another important reason why we're using names. So when we, you know, when he first meets Peter, before he gives him the name Peter, he says, Simon, son of Jonah, right? So this was within a generation of when that happened. You could go back to that town and say, hey, I want to talk to, to Simon, son of Jonah. I want to talk to that family. I want to talk to the family of Jonah. He had a son, Peter, and he had a son, Andrew. And I want to, You could still do this. Right? They, they were still living in that time. So you could, you know, even if you weren't right at the primary source, you had the very next step. You could check on these places. You could go to the town and say, hey, did this happen? Was there a guy here who was blind and got healed? And you better bet everybody knows, right? You know what it's like in a small town. You know who had car accidents when and whose house burned down in what year. We all know those kinds of things when we live in community together, right? So, of course, these signs and wonders, uh, a little bit of a spoiler, we're about to talk of, about a wedding and something amazing that happened at a wedding. You bet everybody at that wedding, they were talking about this for years, right? I remember. I was there. I drank some of that wine. It was really good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. And that was one of the, you know, sometimes people ask me how did they pick what went in the New Testament and what didn't. This, this was one of, the, one of the strong indicators that it should be included, that it was written by an eyewitness, right? Somebody who saw it happen. Somebody who saw it happen. Amen. They're not doing CSI a thousand years later and trying to recreate these <laughs> steps. These are people who were there. 
Okay, so can somebody read for us John chapter 2, verses 1 through 5? And yeah, we are going to stop halfway through the, the big stuff so we can talk. I can do it. Thank you, sir. The next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciple were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Thank you. So I'm going to try very hard not to recap my recent sermon on this passage, but I'm going to mention a few points. And then we all remember it. Oh, you do, do you? <laughs> okay. Well, maybe we'll have a quiz. Um, so we, we did the context, right? It says the next day. Um, one of the things that I think it's important when we're reading uh, uh, this kind of historical story is where were they, who was around, what was going on. You know, as Jesus goes from town to town, different kinds of things happen. When he's in Jerusalem, which he will be in a little bit, it's a very different context than when he say in Cana, which is, you know, not the big city like Jerusalem was. Um, also, depending on where they were, you have different influences of faith. So, for instance, when they are in Samaria, that's a big deal, right? It's an important, important idea to know that they are no longer in, in Jewish territory. So, for now, they are in the area of Galilee which is not far from Nazareth, um, and they get invited to a wedding. So, um, sometimes in the text, we, we want lots and lots of answers. We don't always get all the answers we want, okay? One question I've always had is, why was Jesus invited to the wedding? Have you ever thought about that? Now, I've got a couple ideas. I've got a couple ideas. But what do you think? I think the people wanted to actually see if he was who he said he was. You think word about Jesus was spreading already? Yes. Okay. I don't know. His mother was there. It makes me think that it was somebody that they knew. It very well could have been. Family. Also, Peter and Andrew are with him. And they're back in Peter and Andrew's home territory. So it could be related to there. I think it would be safe to assume that they either knew Jesus or knew of Jesus. Right? I think it's safe for us to assume that he's not a complete stranger. Right? So people are probably keeping an eye on him. Right? There's this idea, and, and you'll see this come up in the different Gospels. Sometimes Jesus is at a place of tension about what he is going to reveal, when he's going to reveal it, and to whom it will be revealed. Okay? So, at this point in the story, are there any humans other than Mary who received prophecy? Are there any other people who know exactly who Jesus is, that he's the Messiah, the Lamb of God? Had some wheels are turning, Marky. What do you think? Disciples know it, don't they? Well, he hasn't called all twelve, but yes, the one he at least there are at least five disciples with him now, right? Right. There's Andrew and the unnamed other who are called first. That's two. We add in Peter. That's three. We add in Philip and Nathaniel. That gets us up to five. Yeah. Okay. So there are at least five disciples with Jesus right now. So five disciples in Jesus. And his mother. Yep, and his mother. Uh, so there are people there who know he's the Messiah. But is Jesus ready to stand up on a table at the wedding and shout that? No. 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 When, 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 when Mary comes, well, let, let's back up one step. When Mary comes and talks to Jesus about the trouble, what does Mary say? She says they're out of wine. Yeah, they have no more wine. She doesn't say, boy, make them some wine, right? Um, 
She's respectful, right? But when your mother comes up and says they have no more wine, there's some expectations there, right? Like, I'm a grown man with children of my own, and if I'm at my mom's house, and my mom comes up to me and says, Paul, the trash can's full, I know what she means, right? She doesn't just mean to tell me that the trash can's full. She's telling me to take the trash out. So there's this kind of uh, unspoken conversation going on with Mary and Jesus. There's the, the part she actually says, they have no more wine. But what Jesus is hearing is, Jesus, I want you to fix this. Now, she knows that he doesn't have a couple hundred gallons of wine in his backpack. So for him to fix this, he'd have to use supernatural means. So this kind of whole conversation happens between Jesus and Mary. And how does Jesus answer Mary? Verse 4. That's not our problem. And then there's one little bit that's important too. My time has not yet come. Yeah, that's not our problem. My time has not yet come. The first part, if you read that alone, could be taken a few different ways, right? Not my wedding, not my problem, right? Or I don't have wine, so I can't help. Whatever. But when you add that second part in, my time has not yet come, why do you think Jesus would add that qualifier in when he's answering Mary? He can't reveal who he is yet. He knows if he performs a big public sign, everybody's going to know who he is. Now, I want to ask, isn't that the point? Wasn't John the Baptist just running around the desert eating bugs telling everybody? <laughs> why would Jesus be hesitant about stating publicly in a broad way who he is. He knew he was going to die for this. He knew he was going to die for this, right? He yeah. was waiting on his father to tell him what to do. He was waiting on his father to tell him the time. Yeah. This, this is talked about several times. When we get into chapter 5, there's going to be some real good conversation about this. But... Jesus does not act apart from the will of the Father, right? We have this understanding that Jesus has the ability to perform these signs and wonders whenever he wants. Right? He could do this. He's, I don't know if I want to say physically capable because this is a supernatural act, but he's capable of doing this. But he has to work within the framework of what God the Father has set before him. And that framework, like Joe mentioned, involves the public. Now, especially when he gets near Jerusalem, there are some people there who are not so happy with Jesus, right? Who are the people who seem to stand against Jesus the strongest? The Pharisees, that's right. The religious leaders. Jesus was upsetting the order of things, and he didn't like that. And these are the people who eventually arranged to have him executed. But Jesus knows that that has to happen within a timeline. He hasn't even called all the disciples yet. So if he runs right up to the high priest and pokes him in the eye and says, I'm the son of God, well, that timeline's not going to hold, right? So he's got work he needs to do. He's able to accomplish it. But he also needs to work within the Father's time frame. So given all these different issues pulling at him, let's see how Jesus chooses to behave. Okay? Um, shouldn't I cover anything? Oh, wait, we did skip one thing. After Jesus says, my time has not yet come, Mary turns and speaks to the servants. What does Mary tell the servants? Just do what he tells you to do. Yeah, that was the plug for the sermon, right? Do whatever he tells you to do. Yeah. Okay. So Mary just says, I'm putting it in his hands. You do what he says. In any place does it, does it say that God spoke to Mary? Not directly, no. Okay. No. And that's part of... I didn't see any place where he had that up. No, but she knew who her son was. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's a contradiction between the two things here. Sometimes it's pictured as such, but I, I don't think so. I think mm -hmm. that, um, and you hinted, I think you hinted at that. Yeah. Uh, that um, we, we kind of see this in the feeding of the 4,000 and the 5,000, um, but... Um, uh, away from Jerusalem, particularly in, in these small towns in Galilee, uh, the, and it's evidenced by who Jesus draws into his inner circle, um, the, the zealots were 
were rampant. And uh, so there was, there was, in Galilee, there was a, a field, a, a spirit of rebellion. Uh, that uh, uh, the, the old adage, an army travels on its stomach, uh, is uh, in, in that time, and as well as now, as you can see even by what's happening in Ukraine, um, you, you, you have to have food, you have to have nourishment, and when you have, a, when you have one of the assets of an army is the ability to produce uh, food for the army, and um, and so the the notion here that if if Jesus stands up and uh, and, and basically in a very in a very vocal way um, provides uh, this element of food, the, the drink which everyone drank, um, uh, provided wine, they would see both the fact that they had the food. They also have the commander, and the zealots would plot to him, and uh, it would be it would it was not yet his time. Yeah. It was not in God's way. I think the statement here that where she says, you know, you do what he says, yeah. is a way for for him to do what he needed to do, but do it so do it in a quiet way, right. which I think is what is being pictured here. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So. You had the Pharisees who wanted to kill him. You had other people who wanted to co-opt him and use him. And he's got to thread the needle, right? He's got to have his ministry shared in such a way that the truth gets out to the right people at the right time so that word can get out, disciples can be called, people can be taught and formed and, and discipled. But it all has to happen in balance. Um, the Zealots, just in case you aren't aware, these were people that... I think today you might call freedom fighters. They were, I guess you could maybe call an insurgency, but they were fighting against the Roman occupation, but particularly against Jewish people who were colluding with the Romans. So for instance, of the disciples, Simon the Zealot would have sworn an oath to murder Levi, the tax collector, if he ever saw him. Um, one of the Zealots were, were, were told to have carried a dagger hidden in the sleeve of their cloak, so that at any time they'd be able to murder someone who colluded with the Roman government or a Roman leader if they ever had the chance. So in some intense situations, yeah. So this is what Jesus is stepping into. And like Pastor <coughs> Tom said, we need to pay careful attention, not just to what Jesus does, but to how he does it and who he involves. So let's keep, let's keep reading here, uh, verses 6 through 12. Could somebody read that for us? Yes, please. Nearby stood six stern warriors, the kind used by Jews, by the Jews for serving, who were ceremonial we washers, <coughs> each woman from twenty to thirty down. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars of water. They filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of banquet tasted the water that had been turned into water. He did not realize where it came from. the servants who had drawn the water in it. Then he called the bride through his side and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had a chance to drink. And you have saved the best to This, the first one. And the miraculous signs Jesus performed at Achaia in Galilee, he thus revealed his glory and his disciples with their faith. Uh, one after more verse. He went, after this, he went down to Cape, to Capernaum. Capernaum. With his brothers, with his mother and brothers and his disciples, where they stayed for a few days. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, we're going to hold off a second on getting to the wine part. And I want to talk a little bit about this next detail. In verse 6, we get kind of an interesting peek into the everyday realities of Jewish living and Jewish faith. 
So for you or I, oh, water. <laughs> um, it's not, not wine, is it? No. Um, if you or I need water, what do we do? Turn on the faucet, right? We're very spoiled in America. Almost all of us have access to clean running water. Right? They did not have that back then, right? Some Roman palaces had versions of indoor plumbing, but not anything like what we have. And that's certainly not something you would have found in Galilee, okay? So if you wanted water back then, what did you have to do? Go to the well and get it. Go to the well and get it, yeah. Like when Jacob meets Rachel, or when Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well, right? So you not only need to have access to a well, what else do you need? You need something to put in the well, right? And then you gotta carry the water back to wherever you need it, have you ever tried to carry a big bucket of water? What tends to happen when you've been carrying a bucket of water for a while? It hurts and it spills, right? Yeah. carried it on head. So you carried it on your head? Oh, wow. Yeah. It's good to know. It's good to know. Um, different kind of growing up. So did you go to a well and get water to bring it back? Like a faucet for a hose? Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's a lot of work. So I imagine you were pretty careful with that water, right? You wouldn't want to waste it. You had to go back and get more, right? Yeah, yeah expensive, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So Jesus sees these six large stone water jars. Okay? But they're not just any water jars, right? They're, it's not a bathtub, it's not a random bucket, right? Ceremonial. They're ceremonial. Okay? What do you think it means for a bucket to be used for Jewish ceremonial washing? What is, it, what is ceremonial washing? What do you think that means? Something special set aside? Yeah. So, you... Kind of where the idea of baptism comes from. We mentioned this a little bit last week when we were talking about baptism, but um, there was a Jewish tradition of a ceremonial washing. When you came in or out of a house, you would wash your hands in water. Okay, and you weren't scrubbing with Ajax, right? So it wasn't necessarily a, a getting all the dirt from under your nails kind of stuff, but it was a ceremonial wash, a little bit more like like pouring of water on a baptism or I try to think, there aren't really a lot of close Christian practices. Maybe the Catholic use of holy water is a little bit like this. Not quite, though. Uh, there isn't really a direct parallel in what we do today in the Christian church. But these jars would have held the water that was set aside just for that. They would have been blessed, and they would have been specifically for that. You wouldn't use them for just anything, right? You wouldn't fill one up with popcorn and take it to the movies. This, that's the only thing these are used for, and Jesus would have known them. Also, how big were these? 20 to 30 gallons each. Rookie, do you have any idea how big the water containers you carried were? Probably, probably 5 gallons, maybe? 5 to 10? 5 to 10, yeah. I mean, water is a pound of pump. Right? So each gallon of water is eight pounds. So this is no joke. Right? These are big jars. Okay? Um, about half the size of an oil drum. Okay? You've seen like the big 55 gallon oil drums? About half the size of one of them, but there's six of them. Okay? I think, and lots of commentators who are smarter than me think, that it's not an accident that Jesus chose these vessels. Jesus chose these vessels to take water and turn it into what? Wine. Wine. Okay. Can you think of any other times that wine plays a significant role in the Gospels or that wine is a symbol for something? The Last Supper. The Last Supper. Yes, the Last Supper. And at the Last Supper, when Jesus served wine, what did he say that wine represented? His blood. His blood that washes us clean. Yeah. 
So we have some interesting symbolic parallels coming in here. Okay? Um, the Gospel of John likes to pull some of those interesting symbols out. Um, as we go through this Gospel, we're going to talk about bread, we're going to talk about light, and of course here we've got the ceremonial jars of cleansing that Jesus takes water and turns into wine. Okay, so we've got the jars. <clears throat> They're huge. Um, you know, this is somewhere with six jars, 20 to 30 each, that's somewhere between 120 and 180 gallons. Okay, so a lot, right? This is a lot of liquid. Um, let's look at what Jesus actually does. In verse 7, what does he tell the servants to do? Fill the jars with water. Fill the jars with water. Okay. So we know the jars were empty when he started, and they're ceremonial jars, and he wants them filled, okay? Now, using Worky's example, do you think it was a small task to fill jars with 120 gallons worth of water? No. No, this would, I mean, this would take a long time running the tap, right? Um, but doing it by hand, you know, going to probably a cistern, getting vessels, carrying them, pouring them in, going back, getting more, this was a big task that he was asking these servants to do, and it was in the middle of a wedding celebration. They had stuff to do, right? But they follow Mary's instruction, and they do what Jesus said. They go, and they get the water, and they fill the jars. Now, what does Jesus do next? Does he do, like, 12 backflips? Does he make mud? What's, what kind of, like, big fancy thing does he do? He sells the water and the wine. He says, dip some out. Okay? There's no giant, flashy, attention-grabbing act. He's not standing on the jars and shouting. He just says, dip some out, take it to the boss, like the master of ceremonies. And so the servants, they do what they're told, right? They dip the water out, and they take it to the master of ceremonies. Now, I think I used to overlook this act, but if you were a servant and you bothered the master of ceremonies in the middle of a wedding and said, here, taste this, and you just dipped out a cup of water, how do you think that master of ceremonies might have reacted? What the heck are you to do? Yeah, why are you wasting my time? Get away from me. Yeah, yeah. I'm busy here. Yeah. So they, they follow the instructions, they take this personal risk, and they take the dipper, and they carry it over the master of ceremonies, and he tastes it, and what does he find when he tastes it? Wine. Yeah. Just any old wine? Nope. The best wine you ever tasted. Yeah. You, right. So this, I hope this doesn't sound too crude, but um, basically people would drink so much wine at a wedding that they would get really drunk. And so they would give them the really good tasting wine in the beginning while they were still sober and save the cheap wine for the end, because by then they don't notice what it tastes like, right? So you want to serve the fancy stuff to impress everybody in the beginning. And the master of ceremony says, wow, you saved this best for last. And how much is there? Do you remember the number of gallons? 30. That was one jar. There were six of them. 180 gallons of this stuff. This is a lot of good, this, like economically, this is a big deal, right? This is a big deal on lots of levels. This is something that's safe to drink. This is something that's a commodity. It's something that's celebratory. On lots of different levels, this was a really big deal. Well, it's about three and a half liters for a, si for, um, a single gallon, and one bottle of wine is normally around a liter. And for like really high end. How do you know that? I read the wine jars at um, gra a grandma's house. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that they're one liter. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. I don't know about that. <laughs> Let's just say they're not Nazarene, but they do believe in Jesus. Kids only learn things. Oh, no. I, you know, when I was asking the question, I was like, you know what, Paul? Don't ask a question if you don't know what the answer's going to be, especially when you're on Facebook. But, anyway. We're talking about Jill's mom, not my mom. Oh, what? Anyway. Uh, so, 180 gallons of wine, very special wine. 
I want you to pay attention to some language that's used. In verse 11, what is this action called? The very beginning of verse 11. Miracle. Is it just called a miracle? A sign. Yeah, good job, Orky. All right. Had a slow start, but you're on fire now. Good job. Yeah, a sign. What is a sign? What does a sign do? Yeah, it points to something. It tells you where to go, right? So this is something you'll see as we go through John, that Jesus isn't performing miracles just to help that person. I mean, what he does does help that person. But he's performing these actions because they are signs to his identity. They point people to who he is and that what he's saying is the truth, okay? So let's look at what is said here. This miraculous sign was the first time Jesus revealed his glory, okay? Has there been any glory revealed yet in John? I'll give you a hint. It involved, ah, yes, you got it. The baptism, right? John the Baptist said, I knew this was him because the Holy Spirit descended like a dove and I heard the voice from heaven, right? right? But that was not Jesus revealing his glory. That was God the Father and the Holy Spirit confirming Jesus. This is the first time that Jesus himself has performed a sign that points to his glory. But remember back in the beginning we had this question of, is it his time yet and who should know? So let's take a look and see who actually knew what happened. All right, let's back up a little bit. Who has tasted the wine? Master of ceremony. And did he know where it came from? No. No, so he didn't know. All right, who else knew? The servant. The, the servants who did the water, and? The bridegroom. Well, maybe. They might have found out later. But at this point, they don't know yet. <coughs> okay. it's Jesus, Mary, disciples, and the servants. Right? And the servants aren't sure. And the servants aren't, they don't even know what happened, right? And yeah. They, this, all they did was follow the rest. Exactly. So, this specifically says, I'm reading verse 11 here. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. It was for them. Exactly. This was for the disciples, right? Because up to this point, they had, they had heard some interesting things, right? Jesus knew uh, Simon Peter's name when he met him. Jesus knew that Nathaniel had been under a fig tree, which these are significant things. But this is really up in the game, right? This is the first time that the disciples have seen Jesus' glory revealed. Yes? Didn't he, uh, wasn't there uh, somewhere in the Bible where he did things that he told people not to say anything about? Yes, yes, and we will get to that. Yep, that hasn't happened yet, but you are exactly right. There are times that in the Gospels where he will perform a miracle, where he'll heal somebody, or cast out a demon and tell them not to tell anybody. But in this case, he's not specifically telling them not to tell anybody, but he, he performs this sign in a way that the people who need to see or are supposed to see are the ones who see it. Now, I'm sure that later on in the coming years, everybody figured out what happened as rum rumor spread and people found out and, hey, wait, I drank some of that wine, right? And that, that, you know how rum gossip spreads at that point, maybe 10,000 people were thwarting, but... Um, in this case, Jesus performed the sign specifically so that his disciples would see and believe. Okay? Now, I want you to pay attention to this phrase because it's going to come up over and over again. That Jesus performs a sign and some people see and then some people believe. Okay? In this case, all the disciples believe. But there are going to be cases coming up where some people see the sign but do not believe. And that's going to be another repeating theme we're getting at in the Gospel of John. Well, the sign is described as mirac miraculous. Yeah. Uh, what, what exactly is that like extraordinary? How would you define miraculous? Well, that's a good question. Well, that's a good question. Um, personally, I would describe miraculous as something, it, it involves two things. One, it involves some kind of supernatural um, display of power, but also that it's under control and under timing, okay? So 
uh, to use one that's a little bit different. There's a time where they're talking about taxes, and Jesus says, go catch a fish, you'll find a coin in its mouth, right? Now, catching a fish and finding something weird in its mouth or its stomach, it's not that odd, right? And fish like shiny things, if you've ever made a fishing lure. So, it's not beyond reason to say that more than one fish in the Sea of Galilee at some point tried to swallow a coin. But for Jesus to say, go, catch a fish, the first one you catch will have this coin in its mouth, and we'll use that to pay our tax. Okay? So it's that combination of things. It's, it's the supernatural event and the timing that is happening under command and authority. So it's the water turning into wine, yes, but it's not just random. It's when Jesus commands it. There's nothing in the jars. The jars are empty, right? So it's not like you can say, oh, well, it was dark out and we thought it was water, but it was really wine. Or maybe it was a different jar. There were six jars. They were all empty. And that's how we started out, with six empty jars. Okay? They got filled with water. We saw the people carry water in jugs. They dip it out and give it to the guy, and then it's the best wine he's ever tasted. Okay? So it happened in a very specific way. So this could not have been an accident. And it happened under his command to display his authority. And really, for Jesus, displaying authority is about his connection to God the Father. It's not to bring glory to himself. It's not for him to say, look how wonderful I am. He's saying that by performing these signs, I'm confirming to the people that I am the Savior, that I am the Messiah. Because that's the whole point of, of the gospel, right? the good news, is that Jesus is the Son of God who came to save us. Right? But when, pe- when he first tells people, they don't always believe him. And even after they see things, they don't always believe him. And that's the idea behind these signs. That Jesus performs signs to physically demonstrate to people that he is who he says he is. Because if he isn't, he wouldn't have been able to do these things. And this is a small one that we start with, right? You know, we work our way all the way up to raising people from the dead. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in the context, you know, it's... it's Kind of amazing that Jesus didn't, um, uh, you know, lead the kingdom of God into place right then, right there, and uh, begin the, um, you know, t- taking over the Roman government and cover the world. Um, of course, that's not what he, that's not what he, what God wanted. That's not what what's called to do. So, in the context of these. Th- approximately three years. It is all about he did this to put faith in the disciples. Mm-hmm. It's all about training them so that they might take the gospel to the world. Yeah. And because even his, even these, uh, the, you know, the feeding the uh, four and five thousand that, you know, in when, when you read how he talks to his disciples then, it's setting them up as if, as if, okay, here's how you feed 5,000 people. This, this is what you do and how you do it. And oh, by the way, okay, um, I'm not going to let the other people do, do anything. Get out of here, disciples, and get on the lake for a while. Um, I'm going to go up and pray. Um, you know, I, so we've, got our, we've done our task here. You've learned a little bit. Now get over there and do something else because I, I, I need to pray some more. It's all about the disciples learning and increasing their faith uh, from, from here to the, to the time he ascends. Yeah. And I think also part of what happens here is looking at who Jesus is reaching out to. We, we spent some time when we went through chapter 1 talking about the fact that Jesus was born to an everyday common family. Right? If we look at who gets to receive this first news, the Son of God has entered into the world and has now, for the first time, revealed his glory. And who does he reveal it to? A king? A high priest? No. A few fishermen. <laughs> right? Not even the master of the ceremony. You're right. Not even the master of ceremony. It's not even the bridegroom. Right? His mom, who was a widow at this point. So a widow and some, some blue-collar workers. That's who get to see this right now. Right? He's giving a dignity and a value to people that that society did not value. People who were not valued by their peers. So would it be also safe to say that a miracle is something that is 
not only unexpected, but unexplainable? Well, I think unexplainable by natural means, right. but for it to work in these, this context, it is explainable by the one who performs it. So Jesus didn't just like walk by the wedding and like and turn it into wine and tell nobody. Well, somebody time, did know. This was done for a purpose. Nobody knew that it was coming. Right, nobody knew it was coming. But he did testify to who needed to know what happened and why it happened. He revealed his glory to the disciples and they believed. Yeah. It, it's an act of kindness, you know. He's not demanding that they just believe his words. He's saying, I'm going to show you who I am. Well, the disciples were all Galileans, right? Um, at, at this point, I, no, I don't, well, as the overall answer, no. But at this point, I don't, I mean, I know that Peter and Andrew were Galilean, but I don't think it's, I don't know that Nathaniel and Philip were. They're from Bethel, right? Well, he picked them up at Bethel, but were they from Bethel? Bethel. Like, the, he picked them up down by where John the Baptist was. No, they were in Bethesda. Beth okay. So they, they were in northern... Yeah. So, no, they weren't all Galileans, but... On the east side of Jordan. Yeah. I think it is safe to say that there were no... What's the best way to say this? No high-class people among the disciples. Right? They were regular people. And many were, you know, you had people like Matthew, who was a tax collector who would have been hated by so many people. And you had Simon the Zealot, who was a, a, a rabble rouser, a, a, a freedom fighter, um, who might have committed some crimes in order to further that cause. Yeah, so this was not the cream of the crop, right? Pentecost, they said they were unlearned men. Like right. So when Peter speaks, he's, you know, People who talk it, like this even happens at the crucifixion. He's got a Galilean accent. They know where he's from, right? You know, when I get up to speak and I say water, people know where I'm from, right? And they expect certain limitations to what I'm going to say next when I say water, right? Yeah. So they, I mean, you can tell by looking at Peter. He was thin, he was wiry, he would have had calluses on his hands from hands on the rope, he would have had sun damage on his skin, right? You can tell by meeting the guy a lot of times what line of work they're in. And yet he gets up and all these languages are heard. And they know this is not something that could have happened from a person. But using our criteria about a miracle, it wasn't just something miraculous that happened, but it happened within a framework where it was explained. Peter says, this, this right here, you're seeing the words from the prophet Joel coming to life. Oh, the Old Testament prophecy is coming to fruition right now in your ear holes. Like, it's happening right now. Yeah. yeah. So it's that combination that it happens for a purpose. Right? Jesus isn't just doing magic tricks at a birthday party. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we're going to stop there because the next section is kind of a, we're going to talk about clearing the temple, and I don't want to split that up over multiple weeks. Uh, if we could, uh, sure, we've got to bring this up into uh, uh, time now, uh, because there there are the signs that are for uh, the signs of his first coming and, and such. Now and then, he we begin to understand, and particularly by the sin color, and the signs of his second coming, and um, uh, using our criteria criteria. Um, the establishment of Israel is one of those uh, un, un, unthinkable, un, unbelievable, miraculous that they seem to have miracle upon miracle oftentimes. Uh, the modern state of Israel being established is a uh, some believe, I believe, is a sign um, that, that his coming is soon. It's a point. It's a pointer. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is miraculous because um, there is no... Uh, we, don't, we, we don't put uh, Armenians back into Armenia. Uh, we, we don't uh, 
And once, once a place is named after the Philistines, we don't reintroduce the Jews. Um, we haven't even reestablished Kurdistan. Yeah. yeah. And, and so it's, it's, not a, it's not a norm for the world to do what was done with Israel. It, could, could it have been done? Is it, is it, is it uh, can you establish a state? Yes. Those, those kinds of things were done. But to establish that state with those people in that place at this time is a sign mm -hmm. and is miraculous. And the fact that it was that it was re uh, it was then kept uh, when it should have been destroyed a number of times is miraculous. It doesn't say it's not a be all end all, but it is a sign. Yeah. So I think there are kind of two aspects of this. There's the aspect of us understanding the truth, being able to know what is happening and seeing this as part of God's plan, but also using the revelation of John and some of the, the truth that comes out in there. We're kind of mushing some things together here. It's so that we might not be deceived, right? Remember that there were other people who had claimed to be the Messiah, right? There were other people who had tried to claim this mantle and they couldn't hold up to the test. They didn't meet the criteria for the Old Testament prophecies, but they also didn't have the metal to do what was supposed to be done in the moment. They all ended up dead, and they stayed dead, right? Jesus is very different. So Jesus, by performing these signs, is not just revealing the truth that he is the Messiah, but it's also so that people would not be led astray. And that's one of the really, really important things for us today, right? In the book of Revelation, it's very clear that when the Antichrist rises, there are a lot of people who are going to be tricked by him into believing that he's the Messiah. Right? Now, if you read Revelation and you know the signs, there's every reason to believe that we'll know this is coming. Right? That this is not going to be a shock to believers. Well, it shouldn't be a shock to believers. But if that's going to happen, we have to know God's word. Right? We yeah. have to know God's word. And it's, it's really terrific that we're being shown and we're, we're focusing in on now how he's not drawing attention to himself. He's doing it for the purpose which God had planned for him mm. to teach his disciples. There is, uh, and that was one of the criteria where you know some of the books that were excluded from from the scriptures, where Jesus was pictured as doing miracles which benefited him, supposed miracles that benefited him. Well, that's not, no, that's we, that doesn't fit. That's not what Jesus does. Yeah, like stories of Jesus as a child or a young adult. Yeah. So, so when when the the Antichrist comes and tries to claim, ah, I'm the I'm really the Messiah, and I and here's here's my miracles. It doesn't fit because he's giving praise to himself, not to the Father, and and so that's one of those things where we as his disciples are learning from this that that we can dis so we can discern what is the true sign of his second coming who is the true messiah mm. and and be able to discern that this man over here is not these this thing over here is not yeah. cuz that's something we have to recognize that there are there are evil supernatural powers that can perform miraculous acts we even see this back when Moses confronts Pharaoh right like Moses does it, then, then the Pharaoh gets his magicians to do some of the same thing. No, they can't compete, but they're able to do some supernatural things, right? And of course, the, the, the Antichrist is going to be able to, it's going to have supernatural powers. But when we see the two witnesses, when we see the wars, when we see the diseases, we're going to be able to know. We're going to be able to know. And Jesus wants us to be prepared. He doesn't want us to be caught unawares. And so there's a lot we can learn here about the identity of the Messiah, about how he comes to us as the true shepherd. We're going to get into some of this, right? But his sheep know his name. He doesn't jump over the wall. He comes in through the gate. He doesn't sneak in trying to kill and destroy and steal. He comes to care and love. He didn't stand on a pedestal and command people to bow down and worship him. He got on his knees and wrapped a towel around his waist and washed feet. So that's the true Messiah. And that's who we're supposed to live. What was that? And we know his voice. Amen. And he says, go and do likewise. 
Go and live like I lived. Right? You don't demand your own way. You, know, you don't demand riches. You don't demand respect and, and deference. You serve and you love and you care. And you sacrifice. That's who we're supposed to be. So anybody who comes in Jesus' name who doesn't live up to his standard is, is not of him. You know, false prophets are a significant theme as we get into some of John's writings and something that the, the people who followed him in that area of the world were really struggling with. Um, and, and that's a big part of what we're dealing with today. I mean, how many people, I mean, they might call it other things. They might call it postmodern deconstruction. But it's the same as it's always been. It's taking the gospel and twisting it for other uses. You know, taking pieces, proof texts, and you know. Jesus gave us his word so that we might know, that we might live. Anything else is a, a cheap substitute and a trick that will lead to that. That's kind of what Jesus is saying here, right? In a very gentle, humble, loving way, he's telling these disciples, you can trust me. Right? can trust me. Yeah. Hmm. You know, he's not going around like blowing up his enemies or anything, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. And any other uh, questions or comments anybody wanted to bring up about this part of John chapter 2? This is, just, are the angels crying right now? Are the angels crying right now? Yeah. I don't think that's what's falling on the roof. But I, uh, I do think angels mourn for those who suffer. But no, I don't think that's what's falling. No. Any other questions? I wasn't expecting that one. <laughs> All right, let's close in prayer. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word that we have such wonderful, easy access to the we can read publicly without fear, that we can share, that we can have commentaries and lessons and Bible studies and, and pray together about it. Father, thank you for this precious treasure. Please help us as we seek to learn from your word, to take it into our hearts and apply it to our lives. Father, thank you for the gift of your son, for his love, for his servant's heart, for the way he showed us to care for one another. Father, thank you. Please be with us this week, Father, as we prepare for pantry and our camps. Father, please help us to be like your son. Help us to do the right thing at the right time in the right way. Help us to be obedient to your will so that your son may be revealed. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <coughs> good night, everybody. Let's say good night, Darlene. Good night, Bethany. Good night, Mom. Good night. Jane, good night. Eric, I think that's everybody. Good night, everybody.